I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 34. I'm Sam Arano, and this is the recap video for the first half of the First World War, where I talk about things I left out of the videos, correct mistakes that I made in the videos, and answer questions from Gaon and Navi level patrons on Patreon. First, some news. YouTube channel memberships are now open for those who didn't want to go through Patreon, with the caveat that YouTube memberships are only at the $1 level because I didn't know how I could offer benefits on two separate platforms. I'm also in the United States, doing a lot of industry stuff, networking with other creators, and I'm also working on my second book, which has essentially nothing to do with my work on this channel. It's just something I wanted to do even back when I was in film school 10 years ago. And since I'm here, I'm going to do it. So I'd like to apologize in advance if there are any minor gaps in my output in the coming months. That's why. But before diving into the true epics of the late First World War, let's talk about what we've seen so far. In my video on the Zion Mule Corps, I at least implied unintentionally that the titular military unit was composed solely of Jews holding Russian nationality who'd been expelled from the Ottoman Empire. However, if you watch that video and you see the list of the dead, you'll see two Hebrew surnames and two Arabic surnames which would have been of servicemen who were natural-born Ottoman citizens or were local Jews from Egypt. And indeed, when I went to do some further research at the Jewish Legion Museum in Avichail, I found that a sizable minority of ZMC personnel were in fact Jewish Ottoman citizens who voluntarily fled the empire and joined the Allies, which we're going to see a lot more of going forward. Now for a minor correction, Winston Churchill was actually a liberal member of parliament when he served as first Lord of the Admiralty during the war. So in this video, I said that the divide between pro-war and anti-war factions was primarily one of the liberals being pro-war and the conservatives being anti-war, with the left being divided. But it's more complicated than that. The Nationalist Party under Gunaris, which was by far the largest conservative party, was anti-war. But the further right National Party, very similar name, was pro-war. Now, the name Ben Arroyo was apparently very familiar to viewers from the Seattle area because it's the namesake of Ben Arroyo Hall, home of the Seattle Symphony, leading some people to ask if there was a family connection. The answer to that is, I can't be certain, but certainly if there is a relation between that Ben Arroyo and this Ben Arroyo, it's very distant. Benaroya Hall gets its name from Jack Benaroya, who was a very large real estate developer in the Seattle area uh, in the post-World War II era, who was Jewish, but he was born in Alabama in 1921, and his parents immigrated from Lebanon. Gaon-level patron Neve Tal asks, You've spoken a lot about how various notable figures in Ottoman Palestine and across the Jewish world reacted to the outbreak of the Great War being vocally pro-Ottomans, central powers, pro-allies, general anti-war, fearful silence, etc. Did these reactions generally follow specific faction lines, old versus new Yishuv, Zionist versus Bundist, first versus second Aliyah immigrants, various movements and parties? Were there any particular groups notable for taking specific stances? We don't have opinion polling from this time period. In fact, political opinion polling as we understand it only began in 1916. Uh, in the U.S. and was only intended to gauge the U.S. presidential election. So complex questions like preferred sides in the war were not on the table. Insofar as we can gather, the vast majority of Jews during the war took the position of whichever country they happened to be living in. Like many of you who brought this up, I have also read at some point in the last decade anecdotal claims that American Jews were more sympathetic to the central powers before the U.S. entered the war but I have yet to find any evidence of that in my research. And Vladimir Jabotinsky in the story of the Jewish Legion claims that a lot of Jewish immigrants in East London were hostile to the idea of fighting on the same side as Russia, but I don't actually believe him because by the time he was recruiting for the Jewish Legion, Russia had become a republic and Jews there had been emancipated. Also, the people with the most deep-seated hostility towards Russia would have been older immigrants who came over as adults before the Aliens Act 1905, and thus would have been too old for the military. 
Of course, there were a fair number of Jews in the various socialist movements who were against the war in general, though many of those, like National Labor in the UK or the SPD in Germany, did mostly get behind the war effort once it happened. To be fair, I haven't really gone deep on Russia yet, but otherwise, to my knowledge, the only place where Jews actively cited against their own government in significant numbers was Palestine, which I'll remind you was still only home to about a quarter of the Ottoman Jewish population. So in Constantinople and Smyrna and Baghdad and Aleppo, the feeling was, if increasingly reluctantly, pro-Ottoman by default. And that's something we might explore when we talk about the creation of modern Iraq later on. As to the divisions within Palestine, they did fall along some of the lines you said. To be sure, Jews in Palestine who weren't Ottoman citizens were more likely to be against the Ottomans because they were now regarded as hostile foreign agents. On the other hand, most if not all of Neely were Ottoman citizens. Most of them had been born there. They were all children of either the old Yishuv or the first Aliyah. And it's perhaps because of that that they felt more empowered or more personally responsible for taking a stand. Now, in the video I said that Jamal Pasha's reason for concealing the Armenian genocide as it applied to Palestine was murky. What I should have said was that it was psychopathic, very much in keeping with everything I've read about this guy. Basically, I don't know how verifiable this is, but allegedly his idea was to distance himself from the genocide in the eyes of the Allies in the hope that they would get the idea to support him in a coup against the other Pashas, by which means he would become the new undisputed ruler of the Ottoman Empire. Like I said, the man was a psychopath. Even among the three Pashas, I've seen him described as the psychopathic one. And yeah, the delusions of grandeur, every conversation of his I've read, he threatened to have the other person killed. Often in my line of work, I find myself engaging with these historical figures as if they're alive and I know them. And studying Jamal Pasha was uh, an experience I'll not soon forget. I look forward to his death. Navi level patron Oshar Gordon asks, you mentioned that the ZMC refused to participate in suppressing the Easter Uprising in Ireland on the grounds that their contract was limited to fighting the Ottomans. But some did end up fighting on the Western Front in France. Did ZMC members end up fighting with British forces elsewhere? This was actually a mistake that I made. Thankfully, to correct it, I now have a copy of Jabotinsky's Story of the Jewish Legion, which has been out of print since 1945. I had to pay $50 for a copy, but it usually goes for like $500, so I was very lucky because this book is the only source for a lot of stuff that's going to become relevant when I cover the late stages of the war. In the book, Jabotinsky says that when Trumpeldor's remnant company arrived from Egypt, uh, which is a real story on its own and I'm sure we'll get to it later, Jabotinsky joined up and Colonel Patterson reorganized them as Platoon 16 of the 120th Battalion of the London Regiment, also known as the Blackheath and Woolwich Battalion. Now, when I wrote the script for Neely, all I knew at the time was that they were part of the 120th and that the 120th did anti-aircraft duties at the Somme. However, Platoon 16 appears never to have been sent into the field in this form. It was only a temporary measure prior to the creation of the Jewish Legion. And while the British army after Kitchener's death did begin to allow soldiers who weren't subjects of the British Empire, non-subjects were still barred from being officers. So Trumpeldor was essentially forced to resign from the British army as a technicality, whereafter he actually returned to Russia to create a Jewish legion there because, spoiler alert, March 1917, Russia becomes Republic and Jews are finally emancipated. So he can do that now, but that's a story for another time. So no, Trumpeldor and Platoon 16 weren't at the Somme. They were just temporarily grouped in with a unit that did. And that is the biggest error of this run of videos. So to make the Yudin Sailing video, I ran my script towards uh, a guy who runs a channel called Sermanity. It's all about, well, mostly about Imperial era Germany. It's a really great smaller channel. He did a lot of work for me. He found me German language sources. He provided the voice of Hohenborn. Go check him out, please. And, and if you really like it, I encourage you to subscribe to his channel. He also wrote to me that uh, the phenomenon of Jews being more accepted in the military in wartime, 
also fell in line with a pattern in which further Jewish emancipation in Prussia often happened in times of war when more officers were needed. The same thing also happened in the War of 1870. This reminded me a lot of the phenomenon of temporary gentlemen in Britain, which I alluded to in the ZMC video. Because there was such a shortage of officers by mid-war, the British were promoting men without higher education to officer ranks. But then when the war ended, they didn't enjoy any kind of social advancement like they had during the war. And something similar, if even more dramatic, happened in Britain during World War II. Friend of the channel Sir Manatee writes again, There is still a huge discussion going on among historians to what extent the spirit of 1914 got mystified. Personal feelings regarding the outbreak of the war differed from person to person. It's true that younger, more middle-class people from the big cities came together to cheer for what they considered to be a just act of defense. In the more rural or working-class environments, however, a general feeling of helplessness and dejection was much more common. So what I said about Jews being disproportionately represented in the Air Force isn't just a phenomenon of Imperial Germany. In fact, it probably sounded very familiar to viewers in the US, whose Air Force also has the largest proportion of Jewish personnel of any of the six branches of the military. At least I think, I don't, nobody knows anything about the Space Force. The Air Force is the only branch that's had a Jewish chief of staff. In fact, it's had two. And that's additionally surprising if you know your American politics because the Air Force, and especially the US Air Force Academy, has a really nasty and really ongoing history of racial and religious discrimination to the point of basically evangelical missionaries within the academy system pressuring cadets to convert for promotions. I actually went down this rabbit hole because of a comment on Todd in the Shadows video on the band Arrested Development. It made sense in context. Gaon level patron Richard L. Benkin asks, My doctoral dissertation was about the East European Jewish community, and so, of course, covered Russian anti-Semitism prominently as it drove much of both community development and the mass out-migration to the United States, Israel, Canada, and elsewhere. In my studies, I found ample evidence that Jews were happy to see Germans replace Russians as rulers of the lands where they lived. Any comments about that, especially given the level of German anti-Semitism that you covered in your World War I video? Uh, I'm taking this because we haven't gotten to the Russian Revolution yet, and the German occupation in, like, the Baltics was pretty short-lived. I'm gonna zero in on Poland here. And as I said earlier in the video, I haven't really given Russia a deep dive yet as concerns the war. But the situation in Poland is interesting. It's complicated, it's always complicated, and this is gonna come up repeatedly in the episodes to come, but World War I wasn't World War II. It was not an innately or obviously ideological conflict. And when the war did start to become more ideological toward the end, it was more of an ideology against the idea of empire than anything that distinguished the two sides from each other. So when the German Empire set up a puppet state in Poland, their main objectives were much more strategic than ideological. To plunder resources, raise armies, and undercut the power of the Russian Empire in perpetuity. And all of these required some level of partnership between Germans and locals. So while there were people like, say, Ludwig Haas, and I'll note that he was Jewish, helping to set up a state structure for the Polish kingdom, and the German military was absolutely seizing control of Polish labor and resources for their own war effort, they also created a Polish army, and they put a man at the head of it named Józef Piłsudski, who would go on to restore an independent Poland, and was also very much someone who disdained anti-Semitism as a matter of state. So yeah, I'd agree with the assessment that Germans were seen favorably by locals, including by Polish Jews. Though I'd caution that a lot of that goodwill comes out of the fact that the German Empire collapsed and Poland became independent. So the Germans weren't around long enough to turn the locals against them. And that's not to mention the treatment of Poles in the German Empire, which was very discriminatory and antagonistic. But you'll be happy to hear that friend of the channel, Sir Manatee, will be releasing a video about the German puppet kingdom in Poland very soon. And that's the recap. Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, FC, Matthew Feinberg, Jay Fleischman, Osha Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Sol Cohn, Jacob Kossoff, Eric Liederman, Jeffrey Schweitzer, and Ian York. And I'll see you soon.